a round of applause just for <laughs> about that part. Sorry, tech team. Welcome to the British Library. The world outside is absolutely horrible, but you made it in here and you're safe from the storms, um, cyber attacks notwithstanding. But here we all are, thank goodness. Thank you for coming. It's a really exciting launch pad of an evening. Um, I'm Bea Rolat from the Cultural Events team and we're welcoming old and new friends tonight. Our old friends, the Royal Society of Literature are here. Um, you can check out their QR codes outside and you can meet some of their team and Laura's there to answer any questions you might have about their brilliant work. And also our new Bezzy mates are in the house. Black to the Future, an absolutely outstanding and redoubtable combo of Sarah, the amazing Sarah, where are you Sarah? Where is she? Star Reveal has moved heaven and earth this week. And Irenison, who sadly can't be with us tonight, but if you're watching on the stream, we miss you, Irenison. Um, please take care. Um, so they have put together a breathtaking Afro-futuristic festival, which is launching here with the British Library as part of our fantasy exhibition, which you must check out. It's brilliant. There's a couple of last minute changes just to run through with you. As I mentioned, Irenison's not able to be here tonight. Stepping into her capacious shoes, is the brilliant Leia Mwanga Magoye. Um, Leia is a storyteller fueled by the power of mythical narratives to reclaim forfeited spaces. And Leia works across theatre, film, TV, animation, and interactive fiction. So Leia will be taking charge of the conversation tonight. And I'm also um, sorry to announce that Tade Thompson was unable to take part tonight because of a, a work situation, but delighted to announce that galloping into that space <laughs> was our best friend, Corey Brotherson, the award-winning writer um, and a long-term collaborator of interesting works that you'll be hearing about tonight. So please join me in a thunderous applause for our fantastic panel tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was such a lovely introduction. Um, I, feel, I feel really. Um, I, feel, I wish I had a microphone. It makes me feel more like <laughs> hot. <laughs> more mirror thing, but I won't do that. Um, <clears throat> I'll, what I will do is start up by um, introducing our panel, um, uh, giving. A, a, you'll have to forgive me. They have such a storied and sort of uh, remarkable background, so uh, it will take a little bit of time, but I think it, it'll be worth it. Um, but also just set out the stall in terms of what we want to do here, which is, um, as you know, quite Ronsiel, as it said on the thing, to demystify genre and the process of creating um, and in inserting oneself into um, mediums and spaces in, in which um, one perhaps is at the margins of or hasn't ordinarily seen themselves in. Um, so what we hope is that this is a conversation that sort of inspires curiosity in people to consume the works of these incredible makers and creatives on the stage, but also... Uh, aside from curiosity, confidence in anybody watching who, who would like to um, do something similar. So ho hopefully the de demystification process will do those two things. But um, as I say, I'll start <coughs> from uh, the very end is Corey Brotherson. Uh, he is an award-winning freelance, freelance writer, editor, and creative con consultant who has built a 22... Doesn't crack, does it? <laughs> <laughs> A 22-year career in the video games is <laughs> like where, how? <laughs> um, uh, it's apparently not a typo, but yes, industry writing for over a dozen companies, including PlayStation, King, and Apple. He is a narrative designer for the indie development adventure game Windrush Tales, um, and worked as a lead narrative designer for Surgeon Studios. He uh, became a full member of BAFTA in 2022 after consec two consecutive years as a BAFTA Games Awards judge. Um, his 17-year comic book career includes co-creating the critically acclaimed urban fantasy series Magic of Mist and writing and editing Yomi and Yemi, award-winning steampunk transmedia series Clockwork Watch. So, Corey Brotherson. <laughs> Our next panelist is Rivers Solomon. Um, they write about life in the margins, where they are very much at home. In addition to appearing on the Stonewall Honor List and winning a Firecracker Award, Solomon's debut novel, An Unkindness of Ghosts, was a finalist for a Lam Lambda, a Hurston Wright, and a Locus Award. Their second book, The Deep, was the winner of the 2020 Lambda Award and shortlisted for many others, including the British Fantasy and World Fantasy Awards and Sorrowland, 
their most recent novel, was awarded an otherwise award. Their short work appears in Black Warrior Review, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, Guernica, Amer Best American Short Stories, Tour.com, um, Best American Horror and Dark Fantasy, and elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> There's more. <laughs> we don't have that much time. Uh, um, and finally, sorry, uh, you do the, do the applause. We did it. <laughs> Finally, Shella Ramanan is a narrative designer on the writing team for Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, a Ubisoft massive game in Sweden. Uh, sorry, Ubisoft massive in Sweden game um, that's out on the 7th of December. Mm -hmm. uh, she's half of Threefold Games, a female game development team from the UK. Who's going to say a few of those? <laughs> <laughs> whose games include the BAFTA nominated Before I Forget and the upcoming Windrush Tech, a narrative adventure featuring the triumphs and tribulations of two Caribbean immigrants in po post war Britain. Shall I? <laughs> okay, so, the arc of the conversation is really going to follow um, a beginning, middle, end. I, I wasn't very creative in this. Um, but just very much, uh, oh, isn't that exciting about doing it? And then, oh gosh, will I finish? And then finally, oh, I did it. Oh, how do I feel about that? <laughs> um, so that's uh, basically going to be the, um, the tenor of the question. So um, to start us off, um, the question, if you each go in turn, the question is, um, which, which of your works are we going to focus on? Um, if you do a really brief introduction to that. Um, and what specific genre does that um, piece of work find itself in, and the medium as well? Um, and why, why that genre and that medium to tell the story you wanted to tell? Start with Corey. Okay, um, so I'll be talking mainly about uh, Magical Myths, which is a ongoing graphic novel series uh, drawn by Sergio Calvet, an artist in Barcelona. Um, and that is kind of like an urban fantasy story which kind of covers a young black lady who's kind of trapped in a strange fantasy world and she's having to engage with gods, monsters, magic, myths, all sorts of things that kind of revolve around typical fantasy tropes. Um, but I wanted to kind of like explore what, I think, don't think there was actually too many stories where we had like black protagonists that were engaging with typical classic Roman and Greek gods. And I wanted to kind of explore that and kind of like slowly sift that element in there about the, the social pol politics that come from that sort of engagement. So that was something that I wanted to kind of slowly build towards in the kind of the range of the story itself. And we've been doing that for about 12 years now. And because I'm a, I'm a slacker, I've, <laughs> I've only got about like uh, three seasons out and several side stories uh, that Sergio and I have been working on. But, uh, but we're slowly getting there to get to the, the final sixth season at some point. Awesome. I love, I love that you describe yourself as a I know. Oh, right. <laughs> um, Rivers, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. So um, the work that I'm mainly going to be talking about tonight is my most recent book, Sorrowland. Um, and when I wrote it, uh, my main goals were to be as sort of upsetting and disturbing as possible, which usually falls into the category of horror. Um, so I think it genre-wise it falls into that, but there's a huge speculative component um, and transformation that takes place that definitely puts it into science fiction and fantasy as well. And where you sort of cut off what's sci-fi and what's fantasy, I think is very dependent on a particular person. But um, I would say it's both. I would say it's horror, it's sci-fi, it's fantasy. It's also been called gothic. Um, so yeah, it's very all over the place, uh, genre-wise. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a story of a young woman, a girl really, um, who um, after sort of fleeing the black nationalist, nationalist religious compound uh, where she was raised um, into the woods, her body begins transforming in quite monstrous ways. And it's her journey from, from that point when that transformation begins. Cool. <laughs> Um, just me. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about Windrush Tales, which is a video game. It's a narrative, uh, illustrated narrative game um, that's framed within 
a photo album and it is about that period of history is set in 1958 within the Windrush generation, which spanned 1948 to 1972. Um, and yeah, so I guess it's historical fiction, which isn't what I started out to make. I just started, wanted to express my heritage in some way. And um, I cons it was around the time of the 70th anniversary of Windrush was going to happen. And I wanted to <coughs> express that and my pride in my heritage and um, the success of the Caribbean community in Britain. And um, I thought about, shall I do, shall I write a poem? Shall I write an essay? And then I thought, um, no, a game would be interesting because uh, I never see, Caribbean people in video games, particularly, I think there are more now. There's a Jamaican um, developer scene, which is really cool. Um, but at the time there was nothing and particularly British Caribbean heritage um, really isn't represented in games at all. Um, so, so yeah, so that's why I decided um, a game and then I spoke to Corey and I was like, are you Caribbean heritage? <laughs> <laughs> I got this idea. <laughs> and he was very cool about it. He was like, yeah, that sounds okay. But apparently he was quietly excited. So <laughs> um, yeah, so that's Windrush Tales. It's interesting. It sounds as if um, the idea was obviously it was is always going to be the idea was first and then the genre kind of sort of wrapped itself around it so you found yourself in historical fiction you found yourself being called mm -hmm. gothic um <clears throat> and obviously yes engaging with um greek and roman myths is going to put you into sort of fantasy or well, myth and fantasy and things like that but like the idea that you came at it thinking about what are the politics of engaging with that and particularly like your your um it's interesting that the protagonists the black um women uh, or, or certainly that's the performance of their gender, um, uh, centering those um, experiences is, is, is a really different way. <laughs> so it's not different if one, if one inhabits that body, it's the same. Um, but certainly it's different in terms of what you've been able to consume. So that um, sounds really... Well, yeah, it sounds quite frightening, because I, I think, I, I wonder that, did any of you have any comps? Like, what did you look at to go, I kind of want it to be like that, but obviously I can't be because it isn't quite like that. There isn't anything that exists that's like what you've done? Not within my medium. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, let me think, were there comparable things? They weren't really, I suppose. Um, or even anything you were inspired by, like sometimes it's I mean, completely cross yeah. medium. Or I mean, definitely in terms of conversations we had on the dev team, it was um, Lover's Rock with Steve McQueen film which really kind of encapsulates that kind of um, black British experience and you know can transcend time I think that Caribbean house party mm. is just like <laughs> timeless it, um, so yeah that was definitely an inspiration and yeah obviously the lonely Londoners um, the Sam Selden novel um, you know sort of seminal work on the um, British Caribbean experience um, yeah, what else? Um, oh, what's that documentary I was obsessed with? Rebel Dread, the yeah. word, um, what's it called, sorry? Rebel Dread. Um, oh, what's his name? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Struggling. Yeah. Yeah, I was obsessed with this, um, oh, my gosh, what is his name? Uh, yeah, so he's kind of a, a, he's done everything. So he was part of the punk scene and he's a black British Yes, the thank one. you. That's thank the one. you. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Like, oh, that's, that's so embarrassing. Yeah. So yeah, I was kind of obsessed with that uh, with that documentary and that story of you know this young black British um, guy um, sort of just um, inserting himself into these subcultures that weren't necessarily black subcultures and just. Yeah, just being so energized and um, driven, and yeah, it's, it's a really cool story. Right, yeah, I really recommend that. I really have to watch that because I, I didn't really see it for punk. Sorry, sorry. Until um, <laughs> <laughs> into the into the Spider Verse, across the Spider Verse. Where does Dan and Kalila rock up? 
It's across. Across the yeah. Spider Verse. Like until yeah. seeing Spider Punk, I was like, oh. Okay. I get. I get. I get. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to know more. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Once you see um, a person uh, that looks like you know someone that you might know mm -hmm. engaging in a subculture that you you mm -hmm. would ordinarily go, well, it's probably not where I want to be. Um, <coughs> oh, I, lo I love this. Um, certainly, the values of it um, is something that I want to engage with. And um, what about you, Rivers? Is there anything that you anything but poetry yeah. music or, or things like that these yeah I mean when I started writing and I actually I, I struggle with this question because I say the same like three writers and they're always already writers that are like quite known and famous and like, in a way that's like its own kind of like bit of sadness that there isn't there isn't this like glut of um a huge amount um and I've really really looked um but when I so I was introduced to Octavia Butler um, when I was, it's like, right, everyone nods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it's like a bingo card, you're like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it really is like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, um, in high school um, by my first girlfriend. And um, I was like, I, before that, like when I wrote stories, I like my default character was like a 12 year old white boy. Like that was just how it, that was who mm -hmm. you told stories about, mm -hmm. you know, like that was just what I thought. So um, yeah, and Ursula Le Guin, um, and then also Toni Morrison. Um, so yeah, so those are writers that have been really, really uh, influential for me and were sort of where I could start to see myself um, and who I wanted to, not necessarily like copy, but who I could like see myself like writing in that tradition. Um, and even now more than ever, actually, Toni Morrison, I've just been reading, rereading her. Like, <sighs> yeah, like I don't even have words. She's so incredible. <laughs> like, um, yeah. What prompted the rereading right now? Like, what is it about this moment? Um, I don't know. Like, I, I, struggle a little bit actually I think as a writer to read um I think um like just time-wise and like mm. life-wise and so I need to read something that like just absolutely is going to like <coughs> that I know is gonna like ruin me um like that's the experience I need um so she's good for that uh, <laughs> I find it like it's synesthesia. Like um, I want something that will feed me, that yeah, will, like um, mm. enrich me in some way, yeah, regardless of what it is. That I, you, you have the same, ex or you, uh, your body has the same experience as if you, you know, had a drink of water when yeah. it's been parched, or you <laughs> had a really, you know, your mother's cooking um, yeah. when you really just wanted to go home and have that. Um, it's really, it's wonderful when you find a writer or, or a maker mm -hmm. who can do that for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Corey. Uh, yeah, this was really difficult for me because um, I grew up a lot on um, the main inspiration for Magical Myths initially was um, the Harryhausen movies, so Clash of the Titans mm. and Sinbad, stuff like that. Um, just a side note, the Medusa model that he made for Clash of the Titans basically gave me nightmares for about 10 years. <laughs> so this is probably the reason why I ended up doing it. <laughs> into my brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my way of dealing my trauma. Um, so yeah, I, it wasn't like I was a kid watching these movies and going like, oh, why is there no black people in them at all? But as I got older, it was something that I slowly kind of started to realize <laughs> as a teenager. So what ended up happening was, uh, this is the secret history of Magical Myths, is that we were originally going to write it for a, um, there was an anthology that I was part of. And the publisher liked my work so much that he wanted to, he selected me to be kind of like part of a, a larger anthology where we do an ongoing series. Um, and what ended up happening was he, he scrapped the whole idea, but he said, I really like the idea, so why don't you just kind of go alone with Sergio and, and just kind of do it yourselves? Um, and then we thought, okay, that's great. And we thought, okay, let's see if we can maybe pitch it to Marvel at some point. Um, that didn't go very far, <laughs> as these <laughs> things didn't tend to. Um, but we really thought, let's just kind of keep going with it and keep building on that. It was Sergio's idea that was to actually make the protagonist a woman. 
because um, he he wanted he got fed up of drawing guys all the time. And he was just like, <laughs> I want to draw a woman. I was like, okay, let's let's reformat this entire story and work with that as much as possible, and and just kind of work with make that actually the story. It ended up being a far better story for it as well, far more interesting story, and it challenged me personally as well. Um, to kind of like look into certain elements of my storytelling and, and certain elements of my privilege and really kind of work around the int unintentional and intentional biases that are there that existed. Um, and when I was looking for stuff to help build upon that foundation of outside influences, I really struggled for a little bit. And I think it was only mainly because I started reading Neil Gaiman stuff afterwards and that ended up becoming the foundational pillar for, for what I ended up writing. And writing. And that was before Anansi Boys came out. It was mainly kind of like looking at the Sandman and <coughs> how they looked at integrating different myths uh, into the storyline. So, and after that point, it's been kind of like just been building on that ever since. But I mean, I've been working on this since before the internet was a thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, my exposure to more stories has, has gratefully increased <laughs> over the years. Oh, <laughs> Thank goodness for libraries um, <laughs> that you had what you had. But, oh, gosh, I, I um, almost had a full bingo card. Neil Gaiman definitely. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don Lex is not on my <laughs> But um, we'll now be added to it. Uh, it's interesting you say, though, there about, uh, you ended there about talking about um, the ways in which a creative decision by your collaborator challenged you, um, or, or so then fundamentally the piece, creating it and, and moving forward with it, <clears throat> brought you to a place that you had to hit up against. Um, a challenge that you need to move through in order to create the, um, the work. I wonder if you could all speak more to, to that, um, because when we were all speaking, it was interesting to hear about um, the path you all took to breaking through the boundaries that were placed around your imaginations in order to make work. And it's frustrating because the time it takes to get to that place, you're like, if from jump you had been able to sort of just, you know, roam free, what, where would you be? Well, we're here now, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but um, speaking of boundaries and limitations that you place upon yourself or, or you feel have been placed upon yourself that you've broken through, what were the ones that specifically making the works um, <clears throat> that we're speaking about brought up for you and how did you work through them? Asking for a friend, not a friend, me. Uh, <laughs> because, and I, I, I think I want to make it really um, obvious, like the mechanics of how, why I'm asking this question to the audience is that um, if anybody is going through the process of making, you do get to this point where you're like, why did I start? Will I ever finish? How will I get around this thing? It's just so, and it's very much internal. So um, if there's anything that you um, made your way through that sort of sticks out, it'd be really uh, empowering or um, certainly instructive to hear about. I, I was personally terrified. I, I think I still live in fear, <laughs> just in general. <laughs> Um, of, of misstepping, I guess, in terms of what I'm writing. And um, it was only, funny enough, it was only, I think, about, about 10, 11 years ago where my wife, who was then my girlfriend, said to me, like, most of your protagonists are women. And I was like, oh, I didn't even realize that was the case. And that actually stopped me for a moment because and that stopped me writing for a short period of time because I was clearly writing from a point of, like, oh, okay, I am consciously choosing women in terms of, like, for magic and myths, but for the other stuff that I carried on writing, I was just <coughs> automatically gravitating to writing female protagonists. Um, I think when I started looking at it and analysing it, it was probably because I wanted to see more female protagonists, but I didn't feel like I was necessarily qualified to write these stories as a guy. Um, and so that really kind of gave me pause for thought for a bit, good period of time. And I can't really say that I 100% got over it. <laughs> um, I still have to consider it. I mean, I, I wrote an anthology, which was uh, an order of protagonists were women in that, and uh, Schiller actually um, edited one of the stories from that. Um, it was a, an anthology called Deadly Adan. And um, I ended up kind of like <coughs> personally ended up moving away from like any sort of themes of like, oh, these stories have female protagonists, but they're not going to deal with what it's like to be a woman because I do not know. And I can ask, most of my family is actually women. It's like 80% women. I can ask them all about their experiences. I can talk to them about that stuff. But having to glean that knowledge, sometimes I don't want to take those stories away 
from other women that want to take to tell those stories. So in that particular aspect, what I did is I, I navigated around that by talking about stuff which was specifically personal to me. So Deadly Adan ended up talking about my experiences with depression and the sort of uh, stuff that I went through when I was dealing with all of that. So like one of the stories was about um, a lady who is struggling to fight against the, the problems of, of constantly fighting. Her uh, hand shakes so she can't hold a gun. Her mental faculties are starting to go. Um, and that was my experiences, unfortunately, when I was under my antidepressants at the time. I was having leg shakes. My, I was really struggling kind of focusing. And, and it's just kind of transposing the stuff that I know I can talk about and feel comfortable talking about into that sort of stuff and, and kind of be also be aware of the fact that, you know, it's okay to not talk about the stuff that you don't know about, even if you want to research it and kind of go through that. I'm not saying you cannot. But if you don't feel comfortable about it, then find something that you are comfortable about mm -hmm. and move around into that sphere. And as long as the story isn't specifically geared around the stuff that you, you, know, you don't want to talk about and you feel uncomfortable about, then hopefully you can build around that as a, as a result. Yeah, that's interesting. You, uh, you talk about um, stepping around um, and fear of misstepping. Um, it's so interesting about, <coughs> you know, Again, the performance of gender is uh, or the one's understanding of gender um, it sort of developed obviously in the context in which one grows up uh, or so the society, and feeling that the binary is so limiting, so therefore one trying to engage within that space and not being that, you feel uh, you, like you're either not allowed or not equipped or not whatever, and I feel like so much of that is informed by as discussed, the list is so short in terms of people that we can look to, but the burden is so large, the responsibility is so large if one is going to engage in that um, thing. So you feel like you're carrying this weight of like, I don't want, I don't know that I want to engage in this, um, in this binary because perhaps there are elements of existing in this form that will be the best vehicle for the story that I want to tell. Um, but I'm not allowed to, or no, because of this. Um, so I don't know. I think it's it's a it's a really uh, powerful um, thing that you've done to sort of go. Okay, I'm going to just step out of that um, cage, as it were, and that understanding of how I'm, what I'm supposed to do, and speak to what I know to be true for me, because I'm certain it'll be true for other people. Um, oh, what, what about you two? Was there any? Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember the. Rem original question but there was so oh, much sorry. there that the was, um, was I'm sorry. no 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 it's, uh, I mean, you don't have to I'm, to I'm just gonna chat I'm just gonna say some stuff yeah um, yeah a few different things um, on that idea of sort of your Im imagination being sort of limited um, and then and at some point becoming opened up um, and um, that's something that happens I don't think just once but many many times and it's still happening uh, for me and sort of tracking that course. Um, one of them uh, was a book by a science fiction writer named uh, Anne Leckie, a contemporary writer, um, her ancillary justice series. Um, and in the book, um, first of all, all of the characters are referred to with she pronouns because uh, in the point of view character is um, from a people that doesn't have gender and really cannot sort of visually sort of clock what sort of gender means and what does it mean for, um, you know, other peoples. Um, and so defaults to she for everyone. Um, and I think that was the first moment that I, it really sort of settled for me that um, the degree to which uh, gender is like, so much built and constructed by the society that we live in and that there could be, um, and yeah, that it's something that's learned and like it's very possible that we could have ended up in an even worse timeline where, I don't know, um, some other sort of random aspect of our physical person we use to sort of sort people into categories that sort of limit our beings. Um, I mean, obviously there are many that, that that has happened with, um, over the course of human history, but um, yeah. Um, but speak, thinking about, I don't know, the idea of like what I can write. Um, uh, my first, ed the editor from my first book, An Unkindness of Ghosts, he asked me once in an interview that sort of all three of your novels that are out, Rivers, all of the 
protagonists use she pronouns, but you don't use she pronouns. Do you want to talk about that? And I was like, oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and are all sort of presumably like women or like women, woman-esque, um, woman adjacent. Woman adjacent, as the the phrase was at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, but every book sort of kind of has also like a trans or sort of gender questioning, gender non-conforming character as a side character or a like romantic interest. And it's like, let's not unpack it. <laughs> 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 Um, so yeah, and like, so my fourth book, the book that I've just finished, and that's f will be coming out next year, um, is the first time um, that I've written uh, the, where the protagonist is um, non-binary or genderqueer or um, you know, sort of not doing gender how they're supposed to, gender fucked, whatever you know you want to call it. And um, when I was one something that I wanted to do when I wrote this character was for their assigned sex at birth to never come out throughout the text. Um, so you never know as a, a reader, you know, that, that aspect of them. Um, but then um, as I was writing, I was like, oh no, well, I write way too much about the body. Like I'm a very sort of, I write about the body and its functions and it's very sort of visceral. So um, at some point I thought, okay, um, it's, it's not going to work to have it this sort of stay obscured. It will feel a little odd and like unnatural to my writing style. And so I thought, well, okay, then I'll make the character a trans woman just because um, the sort of, the, just the um, amount of literature that we have that's out and that's coming out from trans writers um, is mostly not from trans women writers. Um, they're, they're not getting as much to tell their stories and being and are not being published as much. Um, there are a few, um, but like in the, I want to say, um, like my friend Rika was the first trans woman of color to be published by a big five publisher, and that was last year. Um, it, fiction, okay. fiction. Fiction. Um, oh my gosh! Something about stars. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Rika is not all the. Gosh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, Rika Aoki is her name. Sorry. Rika Aoki. Aoki. Yeah. Um, fiction. The first fiction to be published. So like we get, we do get our like memoirs and nonfiction. But yeah. Anyway. So, but then I was like, oh, like am I taking? Then I, then I thought I don't necessarily like want to be the person that takes away. Um, I don't know, am I the person to like write this story? Um, and even if we, if I were to say, you know, even if I answer that question yes or no, like what actually really matters is like the power structures in place. And it's like, why am I in the position to get this, to tell this story over somebody else? Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, I don't really have an, an answer to that, but um, I mean, what I ended up doing is that, um, I've kept it so that the, the, the ASAB of the character is obscured, which was my original goal anyway. And um, I just write about them. <coughs> they, the, the, the story takes so much in an imaginative space that they talk about their, their, what their body is like and what their childhood was like in, in different ways, depending on what suits them at the time. So, yeah. I don't know if that answered any of those. Yeah, no, it really did. It really yeah. did. Um, I, especially the, the um, facing the question, why am I the person to tell this story? Um, and then recognizing that you're asking yourself that question given uh, power structures, but then recognizing, so this is my like process of, of, of recognizing, gosh, the amount of privilege that I have to, you know, haul around this accent because, you know, I got the one of the, uh, the people that colonized the country I was living in. Um, and the, the choices that my parents made or the positions that my parents made. So I have such a degree of privilege uh, to be able to recognize that I'm asking myself this question, to be able to have the opportunity to sort of do something that is just about expressing myself. But even that, um, once getting to that is incredibly paralyzing. Um, the way that I try sometimes to break through it is be like, I often make things or <clears throat> think about things because I'm very angry. I'm like, God. <laughs> How did that get made? What? Like people are just making anything. <laughs> uh, so part they of me are is like, if the I, if I make this thing, 
hopefully it will make somebody else very angry and they'll yeah. make something better. <laughs> and then I'll have that to like engage it because usually I'm making stuff that I want to see or watch or, or, or you know, uh, listen to or, or whatever. Um, so if I make a thing, I hope that somewhere, somewhere, like an incredibly talented person will be like, nah, no, absolutely, no, like, I can't have this. I'm going to do this better. Um, how about you? The question was, <laughs> what is the barrier you broke through to get to the finish line of your project? I mean, Windrush Tales is still in development, so um, the finish line is quite far <laughs> off. Of the demo <laughs> of your project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, the biggest barrier in game dev is money. <laughs> um, the second barrier is that I'm making two games at once. Do not advise that. <laughs> I didn't advise it the last time I was doing two games, but here I am again. <laughs> I've told the team to just shoot me, put me in <laughs> or something. If I say like next year, I've got this great hey. game idea. <laughs> Just like, let me do one thing <coughs> at a time. But um, yeah, seriously, uh, the whole thing, like when you start asking this question, I, I had this thousand yard stare where I just looked into the abyss <laughs> of, the, of um, the weight of expectation on a game like this is just like unjust <laughs> really, because uh, it's the only one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's just this sort of like, soul crushing like pressure to get it right for ourselves for our community for our relatives um for our yeah for, for yeah for game developers who want to make you know unusual games um yeah it's just a lot um we've uh had the privilege of doing some consultation with caribbean elders um, because we got OCA funding for pre-production. Um, so we had two workshops with a, a group of Caribbean elders, or we did a shout out for people to come and um, help us with this game from the community. And it was quite nice because we got, uh, because it's a video game, it's not, you know, there aren't that many Caribbean elders who are like deep into Baldur's Gate 3 <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I'm sure they're out there somewhere. But um, yeah, so there was this generational like bridge where people brought their parents. Um, so we had a couple of people who brought like one person brought their mother and one person brought their father and then some other people who were kind of um, uh, sort of intersectionally kind of um, creators and things like that who were quite interested. And we had two sessions with them and it was really a privilege to hear them talking amongst themselves about what their experience was at that time, their lived experience, which we don't have. We're trying to, um, you know, like recreate this moment in history that we didn't live, even though we are a product of it. Um, and yeah, but it was also just like really uh, anxiety <laughs> inducing because they were really engaged with it. Um, and, you know, they were really interested in the first workshop, we just had the concept and they were like, I just don't know how you're going to make a game. Like, they just couldn't, they were just like, what? And then in the second one, we had a demo where we went into breakout rooms and we played it through with them and it's a branching narrative. So there are story choices. So we would play the game and they'd make the choices together. They'd have like a discussion and be like, let's like, pick the angry, let's be snarky or let's be whatever. And um, and then we came back together to sort of, and they were really engaged by it. And, you know, some, you know, um, some things are like, oh, this this would never have happened or something, you know, there were, and then you're just like, oh my God, we're getting it wrong. <laughs> and then, yeah, you just uh, look into the abyss and you're like, why did I do this to myself? <laughs> and I've dragged these people along with me. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, there's a challenge that I haven't yet got past. So <laughs> it's an ongoing <laughs> challenge making this game. Like we've made the demo and thanks to their feedback and really helped. But yeah, we have a whole game to make yet. I suppose even making, like continuing to create the thing off the back of their feedback, like iterating um, and, and moving through um, that 
even the first thing of like how are you going to make a game of this and my und- I do not I, my, my heritage is Ugandan but my understanding of Caribbean elders is they are not shy or they're kind it was brutal it's kind of brutal they're not nice right right yeah so it's a uh, tough love it's a yeah, tough love exactly. situation <laughs> um, and, um, so I would say one ought to congratulate oneself <laughs> for making it through with you know nothing tangible to show the commentary and the feedback you'd have got from that would have possibly been enough to fell many. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you persevered. Yeah, we did. We persevered. So, um, yeah, no, I think, honestly, you, you're, you're still an inspiration. Even if you, don't, you may think you're, uh, you haven't um, overcome, you have. Um, uh, it's, it, just one thing, when you were talking, it was really interesting. I, I, I was thinking about this idea of um, when you said the first thing you thought of, or one of the first things you thought of was, should I write a poem? Mm. Um, when you, just now when you're talking about it being branching narrative um, and the question, uh, the, the, uh, the point at which, the inflection point at which one makes a choice, mm-hmm. um, I saw a couple of stills and it appears to be that you, the choice that you make is quite emotive and um, it, it was interesting because I was like, oh, that's where it kind of maybe harks back to poetry that um, you have turns mm-hmm. on uh, emotional uh, beat and even though sort of obviously the path is charted by the author of a, of a poem, in creating what you've done, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it's an interesting kind of poetry, I think, in, in the medium of games. And that's quite, uh, quite lovely, because it's, yeah, with, with poetry, it's less about your um, logic and mm-hmm. more about your feeling. Mm. And I think with games, it's very sort of visceral, obviously. Yeah. The fact that you get to engage with it mm-hmm. means that you, uh, your body doesn't know the difference, right? You're, you're practising the emotions that um, the, the character is going through. And so it's quite remarkable, actually, to have gone, ooh, I'm going to take that experience of, like, Mm -hmm. a very prioritising the emotion and put it into that medium um, and connecting the two. I just noticed that, basically. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, Um, observation. Yes. Uh, I think I've... might have. How long before we've got to end? I don't know who I'm asking. (laughs) Uh, Is anyone in charge here? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I just want... Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, <laughs> um, so I will then not rush you on the last one. So as I said, we were doing the beginning, then we were doing the middle, um, the end. So the point at which one you've created something that is tangible, even if not, you know, can be wrapped and given to someone for Christmas, um, or something that um, an end point of a of a of a goal you had. Um, what for the projects that you, we were talking about? What are you most proud of and what are you most excited for about them? Corey. Mm. <laughs> oh, no. Starting with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, no, whoever wants to talk first. I, mean, I'll... No, I'm, I'm, I can tell you the most thing, the thing I'm most excited for at the moment. Um, so, so I mentioned about Magic and Myths and kind of sewing in the, the social politics of, of having a black protagonist kind of working around these gods... Um, <laughs> the, this is a really terrible metaphor and I apologise for it in advance so I thought to myself this is going to be really difficult for some audiences to swallow at first and so the metaphor became like you know like when you have sometimes with children and you, you can't feed them vegetables so you like blend the vegetables into like, oh, into like a paste <laughs> and then you feed them the paste <laughs> it was like I'm going to put a little breadcrumb <laughs> <laughs> Boil broccoli and smush it. Okay. Oh yeah, my parents just like just eat the vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> Caribbean, it's like Caribbean like, tough love again. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was not a choice. It was not a democracy. <laughs> so yeah, it, it kind of I started kind of breadcrumbing those elements in. So some people may notice it very early on, and then as the the story is progressing, it's getting increasingly more noticeable, and we're reaching a point in like we're at the midpoint of the story now of the series and. It's becoming very. It's going to be get very, very obvious after a certain point, and by the time we get to the end of it, it's going to be kind of like pretty much just blaring. Um, and I'm I'm happy with the fact that it's been so subtle that a lot of people hadn't noticed at first, at least for the for the first couple seasons of it, um, and kind of like putting that in. So I'm looking forward to people's response and reactions to to that. Not in a sense of like, ha I tricked you, <laughs> and I read my stuff, but more a case of like, oh, okay, I. I didn't think about it in that way, and now I can see 
the clues and the breadcrumbs that you left earlier on in the, the first parts of the, of the series that now are relating to the back end of the series in itself. Um, and just allowing that sense of, of being subtle. And I guess I'm happy with the fact that like I, my white writing has grown to be a little bit more subtle as well. <laughs> uh, because when I was younger, when I was writing, it was just very much just like throw things in people's faces and just mm -hmm. let them deal with it. Um, and there is a value in that, but there's also a value in being able to, when you're playing the long game and having to do six books of a graphic novel series that has branched over decades, it's, it's really, there's a value in also being able to, to sew in bits and pieces to that and allow the audience to come to a conclusion before you get to that point. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to that in that sense and trying to really kind of engaging with the audience on that sort of level and being able to talk to them on that sort of level because there's a lot of meta text within the series in itself. Um, I'm not 100% sure what I would say I'm, I'm most proud of. I mean, I am, I am really proud of the fact that I am working on Windrush Tales with Shella. <laughs> um, as, as Shella has said, it's, it's such, a, it's such an, a, an invaluable and intimate and personal project for us and being able to discuss our, our kind of histories, our generational histories through something like that is, is something else. And, and like Shella touched on in the previous question, the, the intensity and the, the pressure <laughs> that is there is sometimes overwhelming, but it's seeing the reaction in my family's faces when they've either tried the game or I've talked to them about the game is just, it, there's nothing that I can compare it to. It really just, it makes it feel all worthwhile. Um, my mom was actually part of that workshop, the second workshop that we did, and kind of just seeing her react to that um, was just incredible. So, so yeah, even though we've not finished the game yet, I'm, I'm super grateful that obviously you asked me to be on the project in the first place and, and to be part of that and in that weird, terrifying way of making <laughs> history <laughs> in what we're doing as well. So, so there is that too. Um, Rivers was, uh, sorry, that, that's it. But that is, uh, yeah, there's nothing like the ability to sort of have your, your family um, engage with something that you've made and them, and the end part of it um, is, is just, is quite, wrong, or quite something, or even at any stage of it. Uh, so I'm, I'm so happy you get that experience. Uh, Rivers, uh, what are you most proud of and what are you excited for? I am proud that I get to write stuff that feels really sort of unapologetically me. Mm. Um, it's felt really good and I like being able to write stuff that's really angry um, <laughs> and there's no necessarily real sort of resolution to that anger like we sort of any book that I write it's like by the end of it I mean we this is the world that we live in right and like um even though I'm writing in an imaginative space I'm writing speculative fiction largely like that's still kind of the framework that we're all kind of here um and this is what we've got and we're trying to build something new but like within a lifetime you know, what can we hope for? And sometimes it's just to be able to, I don't know, to be in that, that anger. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what it is for me anyway. Um, I really like that. Um, I'm looking forward to finding ways to be able to create and write and sustain myself that is perhaps like somehow separate from corporate publishing. Um, I don't know really know how to do that yet. I don't know most of the sort of alternative models exist um, are not ones that like would allow me to support myself and my family, for example. Um, but I, I don't know, I think it's worth trying to go for it. Um, and the more sort of like of a name I make for myself and the more stuff that I make, the more possibilities and opportunities I have to be able to do that. So I'm really excited. Um, for that, but yeah, like, um, when I wrote Sorrowland, um, actually, no, like, I'm, I get really into my dedications, um, they're kind of like, you, you, you guys, <laughs> sorry for that little, my, that little twist, um, <laughs> 
don't laugh at me. <laughs> I'm, I'm an important person with important words. <laughs> um, no. Uh, and the, so the, the, the dedication to my second book, The Deep, was, I think, to like, to ornery girls everywhere, or something like that. I don't actually <laughs> remember. Um, because that was me and is kind of still me. Um, and then the third book, Sorrowland, the dedication was, um, you know, to everyone I've ever been and w will ever be. Um, and it's kind of like this pros the, the part of writing a book, I feel like, or the books that I write is an extreme act of self-love um, and reconnecting with myself and wanting to write things that feel extremely authentic and genuine to my experience um, and to my subjectivity. Um, and I, I'm doing that and like what, a, what an absolute blessing. So, yeah. Mm. It's so interesting you say about um, being angry and then also your, um, an unresolved anger, but a very valid one that is able to be expressed mm. because that in itself is a radical act. The idea that one is socialized because of one's, um, you know, a gender that one was assigned at birth or, or, or the way in which um, society is, is, is structured. It's, you're so socialized to suppress um, or to rationalize uh, an emotion that is incredibly valid given the stimuli. You should be angry. Yeah. And uh, given the fact that nothing has changed, there is no resolution to that. So, um, but also about the ways in which the body holds it. Mm. If you suppress it into yourself, it will make you sick. It will, you know, um, you know, contort yourself, like the way you stand, the way all of this stuff, you'll hold it within yourself. So um, allowing yourself to let it out, both in your characters and in, you know, um, yeah. the way that you feel about the world is, is such a, a self-soothing and a gift to yourself. And I'm glad you get to do it. And I'm glad I get to read it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Shella, proud, what are you most proud of? Um, and what are you excited for? Hmm. And then we'll open up to the audience. So start thinking, please. <laughs> and I, I was definitely one of, just really quickly before Shella, so you guys have time to think. I was definitely and am. So I will judge you, but I am one of you. Uh, <laughs> this is more of a... Wow. <laughs> this is more of a comment than a question. That is me. Like, that. don't do that. Don't be me. <laughs> Ask a question. Uh, yeah, go. Okay. But start thinking now, because so... <laughs> Um, proud of. Um, so yeah, so I have this day job where I'm like writing, you know, one of the biggest Hollywood <laughs> IPs um, like ever because I'm working on Avatar. And then I'll have a sneaky check on Slack and the team is just like, so I'm kind of quite absent a lot as a creative director because I've got this massive thing with like huge deadlines. And um, so I'll have a sneaky look on Slack and yeah, maybe it would be, uh, we had a demo, our first demo was at the British Library at the digital storytelling event. Um, and Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, and uh, it moved our deadline up a bit, so we had to scramble. And then we've got a second demo out, which is at AdventureX this weekend and was at EGX um, last month. And that moved our deadline up again. So like things are always tight. That's game dev though. Things always, you like plan and then the deadline goes bing. <laughs> and um, so I'd be at work like working on new, this deadline on this big game and then I'll like have a sneaky look and they're all like just in the slack just beavering away just like I've just dropped the art for you know Naima will be like I've just dropped the art for that thing and then our um like our programmer will be like okay cool and then Corey's like I've just done another draft of you know like the script and stuff like and everyone's just like I had I had this like little idea in like 2018 or whenever it was and then, and now there are these people, and I'm really proud that we have a majority black British Caribbean game development team. And that's like super, super rare. Uh, to even have a majority black team is rare, but like specifically like Caribbean, British Caribbean heritage. And like everyone's just like beavering away on this thing to make this, make it happen. Um, it's just like awesome, yeah. 
awesome team. That's what, that's what I'm proud of. Um, no, I've never. Oh, we love Michelle. I've never heard the term beavering before. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what have been my first thought about okay. what it meant, but I. I they work so I hard. Get, I get it. <laughs> no, this is with which we will move on. Um, but fair. But no. Um, uh, no, that's such. Uh, going back to the emotional thing of it, it is such an incredible achievement to have um, something that grows, you know, a tiny thing that grows into a space where you can hold other mm -hmm. people. And the idea you set it up such that you don't even physically need to be there or, like, you know, yeah. uh, be present. And yet, and still, your vision has been articulated so clearly that they can continue it and they can do stuff and you can trust that they're expressing themselves and expanding it in ways that you will be really excited to go mm -hmm. and read. That's an incredible achievement. You definitely should that. I'm, yeah, I'm proud of you all. <laughs> I like you guys. <laughs> oh. um, but yeah, I think, should we open it up to the floor? Um, I, I'll go here first and then go back up. Would you like to, how, do we, how are we doing it? Oh, actually, we'll start from the back, sorry. And then. Okay. Um, I'd just like to say, I know you said no comments about how, <laughs> how, how I, proud I am of all four of you to be sitting there. You don't know how, you don't, this is historic. <laughs> it's so historic. And I, I don't, you know, for myself who's of a certain age and when I started as a young writer um, of sci-fi picture and fantasy, I was told by a white editor, black people do not write science fiction or fantasy. And now to see you guys up there, you don't know how much it is. You, you, you know, you, it's just fantastic. And I just like to say, the Windrush Tales was wonderful in digital storytelling. Oh, thank you. It was really, really good. So engaging. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just so proud of you guys. And um, I've got a lot more to say, and I won't say it now, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, sorry, who was in, who, uh, if this lady here, uh, I said, would speak and then we'll go back up. Please don't make us cry again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen. <laughs> I even checked my makeup before I came out. I don't want to. <laughs> well, it's, it's good to see tears because it, it, it has touched you and I think it has touched a lot of us. Um, I work in the DE&I in culture in a different industry. Um, but I could see the connection in how you want to express some of the things that you feel and, and, and bring people in. I'm just wondering if there are any issues that you wanted to convey in your product, whether it's a game or a book, but it was particularly difficult to communicate that. And, and what would that be? Is there anything that you come across you really want to express, but it was particularly difficult and what was that? And, and, and what blocked it? I was wondering what the bottlenecks are in some of the things that you want to express and, are there ways to address them? Thank you. I think for me, I can ask, is that okay if I? Mm -hmm. um, yes, is the, the answer to that question. And it's like most feelings. Like I feel like there's always a gap between this like sort of pure sense I have of what it's experienced like and how I feel it in my head and writing about it and how I'm able to sort of make sure that when people read it, they sort of receive that feeling um, as I'm experiencing it. And I think the one that I struggle with the most is probably love. Um, and yeah, I don't know, like in a lot of ways, I, I spoke about anger. Anger is really easy to like visualize and have sort of um, sort of physical embodiment of what that looks like. Um, same with sadness. I mean, no, it just makes somebody cry, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, oh, I'm being reductive, but you know what I mean? And I think love and, like, how we sort of relate to one, one another um, is really, it's really difficult not to sort of use shorthands that kind of phone it in a bit mm -hmm. um, and that you, where you can really feel in it and you believe in it um, as a reader. So um, it's something that I'm just always working on. I think from Windrush Tales, uh, um, so I really wanted to have um, the female perspective because a lot of the imagery of Windrush is men in short suits and get a hat. Um, a good look. <laughs> it is a great look. Um, 
and we have those too. <laughs> but um, and originally we had a child as well, so there were two playable characters. There were going to be three, so we were we wanted to tell um, the story from a child's perspective and what that's like. Um, you know that school experience that you know we were like talking about some of our terrible yeah. school experience. <laughs> um, and tapping into that but as we started kind of mapping out the story and doing like uh, character bios and um, just like uh, how the characters related to each other and um, just fleshing it out the child it just this wasn't their story um, it is a I think it is a story that needs to be told I think um, we both feel that but this one wasn't it the, you know we just like I could you know, I was looking at the board that we had this sort of virtual post-it note board and I was like oh what's happened to the child they've kind of like gone we haven't got anything for them so um yeah so it was kind of sad to have to kind of put them to the side for that story that there will be a story for them but yeah this one wasn't it I need a um, slight answer for like a, the, a piece that I made um, over the summer. I <clears throat> really struggled with um, the feeling of authentic, like conveying the feeling of authenticity, because what I recognised in everything that I've done is being uh, diaspora. Authenticity to me starts with feeling grounded, like having a, a, a feeling of a sense of. Um, safety I don't know something in terms of you've, you've placed your feet somewhere and you know who you are and you build yourself up when that's so constantly shifting because you're not quite sure quite how much of you is this or quite how much of you is that and this and the other and then the recognition of so much of how I I would construct myself or my stories or or the feelings that I was trying to convey was in response to was a reaction to a, a box that didn't quite fit me um, and so it was still mediated through some a lens of someone else so, uh, someone else's lens and I you don't, which really frustrated me it's like I don't want to be creating something because I was told I couldn't although a lot of the time that obviously was a stimulus and things like that but I think the most difficult thing for me has been to find who I am myself I'm not um I didn't grow up in Uganda I didn't um and I, it was all manner of moving around or whatever but the point is that trying to find out who I am and therefore what even recognizing what the feeling is that I'm trying to convey and is that authentically me or is that am I still being um, limited in a space that I didn't even choose to be in all of undoing all of that and the energy <laughs> the energy that that takes um, is so often so exhausting that it's paralyzing. But one, if ever I get through it, I'm, I'm really, um, I, I appreciate it. And yeah, so in the summer I made this thing and for various reasons, I was really annoyed and angry and all. And then at a certain point I was just, there was a surrender to the fact that I had a huge amount of grief that I was going through. I was like, you know what? Okay, society isn't, what is it? We have what we have. We are in the world that we're in. <laughs> okay, but what I, I'm wrestling with when I'm with myself all the time is trying to move through a world in which I don't have this person anymore. And so I'm going to speak to that and tell, say that as honestly and truthfully as I can um, because I need to get it out. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, I was, uh, it's oddly a privilege, I guess, to have to be broken down to that extent that you can only speak the truth, your truth, because that's all you have left. Um, but I'm like, Rather, it didn't have to be like that every time. You know? <laughs> there was a, if there was a way to make it a little less um, traumatic, that'd be ideal. Um, but yes. Yeah, actually, that could, I think all of your responses touch upon kind of my response as well, really. Like, I can definitely feel like there's a massive overlap in that. Um, I think there's always this duality between like what you want to write and what you're experiencing and the message and the story that you want to tell as well. And... For me, I, what I find difficult in particular, you know, in regards to your question, is that there's this innate rawness of message that I want to talk about because it's so emotionally resonant to my experiences. Um, you know, whether it's a lot of my stories about identity and trying to find identity, um, and how my identity is kind of 
changed over the years. And there's a natural gravitation to want to write about that, but there's also this such an emotional rawness that I need to be able to step away from that to, to write it from a, a sense of clarity. I still want to have that emotion because that's what readers connect to naturally, but at the same time, because I want to make it a coherent story and not just a rant, and not just me just blaring constantly, just screaming at the page, <laughs> going, read this, <laughs> this is me. <laughs> um, you know, I want to put it in a, a coherent narrative. I want to shape it, I want to form it. I want to make sure that it feels like something of substance. Um, and there's always that difficulty of bridging that gap and, and not just pouring myself out there for it. Um, and very much like what you were just saying there, it's like the, there's certain things, um, like you touched on grief, and there's certain things around that which I want to write about, but I struggle to, um, just because it is too much for me to process. But I know that you know, we're all writers here. We know that we tend to process our emotions and our traumas through our writing anyway. That's just something that we naturally do. So being able to walk away from that from that emotional rawness and that emotional intensity and kind of say, okay, I need to compartmentalize that, put that in a box, and then I'll come back to it later on. What I'm feeling is entirely valid, and I'm not going to deny that, but I need to be able to step away from it to be able to write about it in the future. Um, despite the fact that there may be a voice in me that is going, you must write about this right now. You must, you're feeling this emotion, and you must get this into words and put it out there. Um, and there's always that dichotomy of like, I want to do that, but I can't do it. And will I still have that emotional resonance when I get round to doing it? Am I going to still be able to convey what I want to think and express and feel once I've actually got around to that bridging that trauma gap, gap and, and moving into actually the process of working on it? So that I do find difficult. And because I, I, I always try to write about stuff like my anxiety, my depression, my sense of identity and racism and all that stuff. Um, it's, you know, I think we're all in the same boat where we're probably experiencing that so often and so commonly that it's like, it's like when am I gonna get a chance to heal from that to be able to write about it? In the first place? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I think that for me is is the the thing that I'm still trying to process. It's um, it's trying to work through and trying to kind of get onto the page whenever I'm doing it. Okay, um, we literally have three two minutes left. Um, I don't know if anybody's got a question that could be like a quick fire. Search your soul. <laughs> <laughs> is your question one that could be answered in two minutes or less by three people? <laughs> yes, put your hand up really high. <laughs> All I can do is say thank you. This is fabulous. <laughs> Go. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if mine can be answered in three minutes, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, but yeah, just thank you very much for like all your responses. I really enjoyed listening to all of you speak. Um, and I wanted to say that, like, I think a lot about sort of, you know, legacy and like, because I'm a writer myself and sort of thinking about, you know, what do, what do I want to write about? What do I want to be known for? And I wanted to ask, like, is there anything that, you, or this is to all three of you, um, that you would want to be sort of known, recognized, remembered for when you're, you know, in talking about sort of Afrofuturism and the future, when you're no longer around, what would be your sort of legacy and what would be the thing that you're sort of remembered for? Um, and does that sort of inform your, your present, your present work now? Hmm. I don't think I'd let that, I mean, that'd be quite narcissistic of me to be like, <laughs> can I, can I, can I, you said three, but do you mind if that, I... Oh, this is oh. everything about me. Well, <laughs> no, I about like, this question yeah, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> Let me be more. Sorry. Wait, do you guys but, want to go first? Does anyone? No? I mean, I, I guess it would be nice if someone was inspired to do their own thing. That would be great. I think definitely the legacy I'd want to leave and what I hope to leave is one where... Um, it, yeah, I think maybe why I was so... Um, inspired by you is creating a space a really tangible one people actually paid mortgages fed their children mold, like and it was exponential they created a way of making that um inspired and grew other people and other people and other people i want my legacy to be 
somebody that made a space that cut through all of the things that we're talking about that like limit us in terms of like the construct of where power lies, where money lies. If I, I want to one day be able to make it such that all of those things are not the issue. You start from a place of possibility and lots of people were able to do that such that they were able to do that for other people and they were able to do that for other people. Um, oh yeah, I would really want that to be my legacy. I think we do that collectively, but it's a lot for one person to do. We have to. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> to, but to be the start to, to but perhaps that's it, to create a collective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I see, other, not, not that I would be the only one. I mean, perhaps that's the other thing as well, that I wasn't the only one. Oh, I'd love it. Mm. I would love it if it was like, oh, yeah, there's loads of her. Yeah. Um, she was amazing. Yeah, it's like, and, oh, she was what? brilliant. Another she, one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got a dime a dozen of those. <laughs> In, like, because, yeah, because you think about um, other demographics uh, with other levels of ability um, and the fact that there are so many of them getting so many opportunities. I want to have that. I want to be one of many, um, but still incredibly ambitious and incredibly bold. I'm just aware of time. I want to say that mine is very similar to yours, um, but also I think I my legacy. I want it to more be about like not necessarily about my writing, about the person that I am. Like I want to make sure that I'm living a life consistent with my values and living my politics and doing as much as I can to you know build the world that I want to live in with the resources that I have. Mm -hmm. um. This one's a difficult for me to answer. Uh, I think if if people have read, um, and I'm sure this is true of all of us here, people have read the stuff that we've written and it feels like they've connected to it in some way and it actually has helped them in some way, regardless of what that may be, that it makes them feel, like you said, it makes them feel like they're not alone yeah. and that they can they can work through whatever battles that you know they're working through because we've all, we've all got them. Then that in itself, I think, is is an achievement, and you know, I'd love that to be the case. The work that we've gone through. Um, oh, you're a couple of minutes, Ava. I, I will say because she's watching. I do know Ava that my legacy will be that I was Ava's mum. So <laughs> it's fine. Like I know what I want it to be. What, what it will be is that I know. <laughs> so we get we want to get home. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, to this panel. Thank you so much, Renison and and Tade, um, for being an incredible uh, physician. But um, yeah, thank you so much to the British Library as well. And just one last round of applause for such a <laughs> wonderful.